Good morning. If you want to have uh, that passage in front of you, uh, 1 Peter, chapter 2, and verses uh, 13 to 17. Let's just pray before we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, would you be with us now as we look at your word? Would you speak to us? Would you challenge us? Would you encourage us? And would you be with us uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit as we come to your word this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's in God's great wisdom that we've come to this part of 1 Peter this week. We've been going through 1 Peter uh, for a number of weeks, uh, but the week after the elections here in Wales, we've come to this passage uh, regarding how Christians ought to obey the government. And as we've seen throughout this book, uh, Peter is trying to stress to believers that he is writing to uh, that they are elect exiles. That's the phrase we're going to hear time and time again whenever we look at this book. They are first and foremost citizens of heaven. They are under the authority of King Jesus, which then begs the question. If we're not truly citizens of Wales or of this world, how do we relate to human institutions? If we answer to God rather than to men, does that mean we are accountable only to God and we can bypass rules that uh, have been put in place by man? Our faith is not lived in, in a vacuum. It affects everything that we do. So this includes how we interact with authority. Now, right off the bat, I need to say this morning that as a Christian this morning, your ultimate allegiance is to God. It's not to someone in this world, it's to God. No human institution has inherent authority. That was the issue with the Roman emperors at the time. They saw themselves as gods. Maybe our leaders do not have that exact same God complex, uh, but they may see themselves as a, as a law unto themselves. Yes, they are, they are leaders with power and authority. Uh, they have immense responsibility, but they are accountable to God. They've been put there by him. So their authority and their position of power can easily be taken away. But from this passage, we see that authority is there and it's meant to be used for good. God has given us power structures in order for justice and law and order to be carried out and lived out in society. Now, authority more than ever is, is viewed with suspicion. Authority is a, is a dirty word today. We are a rebellious people by nature, and the word authority makes us feel uneasy. It's part of our sinful nature, isn't it? If our uh, mums growing up would tell us, do not touch that plate, it's hot, what would you do? You touch the plate, if you're anything like me anyway. Or if you see a park and you see the sign, keep off the grass, don't you just want to run on that grass? Maybe, maybe that's just me. Um, but it's within us, isn't it, to, to question authority. That comes from our sinful nature. And public trust in the, in the government here in the UK has dropped to the lowest point in, in years. Uh, there was a survey published in the last 18 months. Only 15% of the respondents said that they trust the government most of the time. It's the lowest level recorded in 40 years. 34% of the people said that they never trust the government. Maybe you would have answered in a similar way. But here and elsewhere in the Bible, we are called to submit to our leaders. I don't know if you're much of a wrestling fan. I'm not, and I uh, constantly mock my brother-in-law for being a, a wrestling fan. Um, but I know that the general aim of wrestling is to get the other person to submit to be uh, powerful enough and, and menacing enough and uh, to have the people that write the scripts enough to uh, get them to submit to you. The last thing you want to do as a wrestler is submit to your opponent. 
But here in today's passage, we are called to initiate submission. We're told to submit to every ordinance of man, whether kings, whether governors. And next time we'll look at how this plays out in the workplace. We are to submit, not because we've been beaten, not in fear of the government, but as it says there in verse uh, 13, for the Lord's sake. So how is it we're supposed to respond to leaders who are, uh, we sometimes feel are godless, who are corrupt, who are inept, who are selfish, who are maybe all of the above? I hope as we look at these verses today, we'll get a, a good picture of what the Bible says about how we as Christians should submit to the government. Let's be clear that the Bible clearly endorses authority. David, the the great king of Israel, his last words are recorded in the Bible in 1 Samuel 23. This is what he says. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. God is pleased when people rule well. We also see respect for governors in the life of Jesus. Uh, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law wanted to catch Jesus out and show that he was a traitor against the Romans. They're trying to get him to say something incriminating. So they said, should we pay taxes? Jesus said, whose head is on the coin? They said, Caesar. Jesus gives us this genius answer, therefore render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were blown away by that wisdom, but we can see that Jesus wasn't an anarchist. He was willing to play his part in society. Or think of Paul's letter to the Romans in, in Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. Or in Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, the first one, uh, chapter two says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So we have a a well-rounded and clear view in scripture that we are not to be a law unto ourselves. So how should we as Christians, as elect exiles, live? Well, here are some observations from this passage and what other passages say about government. There are five things I want to look at this morning. Firstly, no one is in power without God's permission. No one is in power without God's permission. It's been a tumultuous year, hasn't it, uh, for governments across the world. And you may look at who is ruling Uh, in this country or in other countries and think, how on earth has he or she got into power? How on earth are they still in power? How could someone like that be in charge? And the question of how could they be in charge is a question that is, is, is not a new one. There's precedent for it in the Bible. The Bible is, is full of examples of leaders who've done far worse things than spend £850 on wallpaper. Their corruption and their thirst for blood and their foolishness would make the leaders of today blush. Think of the kings of Babylon who invaded countries and uh, took them to their own. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was a mighty war general and a ruthless king. He took drastic measures to ensure that the crown was his. And one night he had a dream which troubled him. He knew that it meant something. So he got his his men in, uh, astrologers and so on, to to try and decipher what this dream meant. And none of them could work it out. And then he turned to 
the Israelite Daniel. And this is what he said to Nebuchadnezzar. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. You see, if we believe that God is sovereign over everything, control over everything, which we do, then that includes the rulers in charge. Nebuchadnezzar thought his kingdom, the Babylonians, would last forever. And the people that came after him, the Persians, they thought the same. So did the Greeks that came after them. And so did the Romans after them. None of those world powers came into power without God saying so. Even those who seem so cruel and uh, far away from God's character, they have been put there by God. We, we looked at Habakkuk, didn't we? The book of Habakkuk a few months ago. And Habakkuk was dismayed that the Assyrians were going to come in and invade. How could you do this, God? God was in control though, wasn't he? He told Habakkuk exactly what was happening. Nothing happens without God knowing. And that was true for the Christians that Peter wrote to. Now, they would have suffered for their faith. They lived under Roman rule, a society that was, was very difficult for, for Christians, where there were many gods worshipped, where uh, the whole idea of worship was so vastly different to what we have in Christian worship. Different temples, different animal sacrifices for different gods, uh, drunkenness and debauchery wrapped up with their worship. Emperors, too, as I said before, were considered gods. Therefore, uh, when a Christian swam against the tide uh, uh, in the way that they, they lived, they, they spoke, and the way they worked, you can see how they were very opposed to everyone else. They would have found it very difficult to make friends, to get jobs, and they would have been ridiculed. They would have been maligned and ostracized by everyone around them, and they would have been imprisoned or worse in some cases. But Peter, like Habakkuk, like Daniel, like Paul, knows that despite all these difficulties, it's in God's plan. Submit for the Lord's sake, he says in verse 13. You do not say that if you think it's not in God's control. Not because the emperor is, is inherently worthy of praise and honor. Not because it's easy. But by doing so, we're trusting in God. We're obeying God. You're trusting that God is doing something through this, which leads us to the reasons why governments are put in place. Secondly, look at verse 14. Governments are there to do good, is my second point. Governments are there to do good. Let's read verse 14. Or to governors, as to those who are sent by him, by God, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Did you have to read Lord of the Flies for school? Did any of you read Lord of the Flies for school? Maybe you're one of those weirdos that reads for fun and you read Lord of the Flies. Um, William Golding's novel uh, from the 50s, I think it is. It tells the story of a group of boys uh, who, after crash landing from a plane, they find themselves alone on a desert island. And they develop rules and systems of, of organization without their... Uh, adults there providing uh, government or, or order and the children eventually become violent and brutal it's quite a, a disturbing book to read and uh, Golding that the author is suggesting that uh, the boys descent into into chaos shows that by uh, us but in it, uh, by being human we are we are savage really without government we are savage and it's clear that we would be in a worse place without the order that God has given us of government and rulers. Anarchy is not good. No rules, no order, no structure is a recipe for disaster. God has put governments in place to prevent the chaos that would come from uh, the rioting and the, and the ruling that would come uh, when uh, there is no one in place to rule over. And verse 14 tells us that governors are there, sent by God in order to punish those who do evil and 
to praise those who do good. That is, in essence, what a government is here to do. Living in our fallen world, we will never have a perfect leader in charge. Until King Jesus reigns, we will have someone who sins in charge. But here, at least, we have a clear depiction of what they're supposed to do. And God has given us a sense of justice, hasn't he? And especially within government, we desire to see them uphold a standard of justice. Our default position, therefore, as believers is to support our government, to pray for them, as we see in the scriptures. But governments and those in authority do not always rule in this way. You may have seen uh, the film that came out, I think, three or four years ago, The Post, um, which highlighted the uncovering of the, of the Watergate scandal uh, in America. Or you might have seen Official Secrets, another film which came out, uh, which looked at the way which torture was used um, post 9-11 in America in order to uh, gain information from um, uh, the Arabic nations. But it was done completely uh, forcefully and, and in, a, in a disgusting way. Or even think about this obsession this country has with line of duty and uh, the corruption that is at the fore of uh, uh, an organization that is supposed to be uh, standard bearers of justice. We see it when we read our newspapers, bribery, lobbying, there's something that makes us angry when we see evildoers abuse their positions of power in order to gain more power to do evil or to make money. And, and men and women that do this do so uh, under God's watchful eye. But we should also see those who do good, who work faithfully and who serve others. They should be recognized by God and by governments. This means that we as Christians have a biblical warrant to denounce and speak out against the government when it fails to punish evil and reward good. And consequently, on the other side of that, we ought to thank and praise God when we see our own government punishing those who have committed crimes, when they make decisions for those who have been left with no help, when they haven't served their friends, but they've looked out for others, when they've, the healthcare system has been in good, when vaccinations have been uh, made available so efficiently, when people are paid fairly for what they do, we should praise them for that. We should thank God that they are doing what they've been put in place to do. All these things are a reminder of the, the way that God had planned government to do things. And so we remember, thirdly now, doing good is the aim. Verses 15 and 17. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. What Peter said before in this letter still stands, doesn't it? Our ultimate aim in everything we do as Christians is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness. And as he said in verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak out against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Our obedience and our care for the law should be a witness to our friends and neighbours. When they, they see our good works, it reflects Christ. Peter speaks of, of silencing the ignorance of foolish men. This means that if someone makes a false claim about us, about our, uh, the way that we've lived, the, what, what we have done, our good actions will serve to leave our critics silent. They won't have a leg to stand on because they will see that our, our good works back up the faith that we have in God. Our obedience is a reflection of the good God that we worship. Fourthly, fourthly, when do we disobey? When do we disobey? So we've seen that we are, our default position is to submit to government. We should only disobey when it goes against God's authority. 
Now, there are little laws that might frustrate us. Council tax, when bins don't even go out on time. Uh, speed limits, when you think you should be able to drive that bit faster. All those little things that might frustrate you and you feel they might infringe on you. But what are we commanded to do in the Bible? We're commanded to submit. Do they prevent us from worshipping Christ? No. So we submit. Uh, one issue I want to focus on uh, in particular is uh, why was church not allowed to meet during some parts of the pandemic? Was this something that we as a church should have disobeyed? This matter is what has caused some huge divisions in the church over the past few months. A number of churches in the UK and more notably churches in the US uh, said that they would stand against governing authorities. They said that not to be able to meet in person on a Sunday was a line that was crossed. Therefore, it had to be disobeyed. Some went as far as saying that the churches that didn't disobey would not be honoring Christ. Now, we disagree with this on a number of levels. One, we hadn't been forbidden from preaching the gospel. There wasn't a gagging order from us uh, for us for, for teaching the Bible. We were told that for a while, we wouldn't be allowed to meet in person. But uh, if you follow us on our YouTube channel, you'll know that we were sharing testimonies. We were doing devotionals. We were worshipping on Zoom and on YouTube without any restrictions. Now, I saw some people comparing uh, this situation to the persecuted church. They were saying, this is beginning to look a lot like North Korea. We need to wake up if we think that we faced anything close to that level of uh, scrutiny and control. We have such freedom in this country. Uh, secondly, it wasn't aimed exclusively at Christians. Muslims weren't allowed to go to mosques. Hindus weren't allowed to go to temples. Uh, Jews weren't allowed to go to synagogues. Um, drinkers weren't allowed to go to pubs. Uh, cinephiles weren't allowed to go to the cinema. It, it wasn't even just targeted at religious people, was it? Uh, football stadiums, casinos, uh, cinemas, pubs, they were told to close at different times. Thirdly, this is not the first time that the church has had to adapt. There's historical precedent for this. The plague in the 16th century led governments to tell churches not to meet for a while. In the Second World War, churches were asked not to meet on Sunday evenings because the lights would attract bombers that flew overhead. We agree, of course, with statements that were put out by those churches that, uh, that disobeying Christ is wrong and that, that no authority can tell us when and when we can't meet. But the main bone of contention uh, for us as leaders of this church was that many of those churches did not consider COVID dangerous. Now, we've all been affected in some way by this illness, knowing people who have died, knowing people who have been seriously ill. And for that reason, we were willing to submit with what the government told churches. For the Lord's sake, we humbly submitted. We do need to keep our finger on the pulse, though, don't we? We must not blindly follow legislation, but we prayerfully think about what we are doing. Is this limiting our religious freedoms in this country? Is it an infringement on worshipping Christ? And yes, it was strange and difficult not to meet in person, but we felt that we could meet online with clear consciences. Now, what if the government did say it was illegal to meet? What if Christians here were not allowed to own a Bible? There's also a precedent for that. There are a number of biblical examples of people disobeying the government in scriptures because it would have caused them to sin. Think of the book of Exodus. We're looking at Moses. That must have been a year ago now. But um, think of the Hebrew midwives who disobeyed Pharaoh's order to kill all the baby boys that were born to the Israelites in Egypt. They knew that that was against God's law. Think of uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, there are uh, the time when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar tells all his subjects to bow down to this golden statue that he's made of himself. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, refuse. And when arrested, they say this, 
King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. Even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set us uh, set up. Or think of when praying is forbidden. They are only to pray to the king. Daniel prays, doesn't he? He does exactly as he did before. He's thrown into the lion's den, isn't he? And the same thing is found in the New Testament. Uh, when Peter and John, Peter, who wrote this letter, was arrested by Jewish authorities and commanded not to speak or teach in Jesus' name, what do they say? Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And they carry on teaching in public and they're arrested again. They, uh, the, uh, the high priest says this to them. We strictly charge you not to teach in his name. Yet here you are, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Our submission to the government is supposed to be held with, uh, in view of what God wants from us. Peter warns us that our freedom as Christians doesn't give us an excuse to sin. Verse 16. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. So there's this tension between the fact that we are free as servants of God, but we're also subject to the government. And this goes to say that just because a government allows something doesn't mean it's a good thing. This goes for evil governments like the Nazi regime or, or in Rwanda, um, who made their citizens do awful things. And those things were legal. And yet they weren't the right thing to do. Or even on a basic level, uh, there are things that uh, are legal in this country. Uh, gambling, uh, sleeping around, which doesn't break any human laws. But we are serving the living God and we mustn't use our freedom as a, what's the phrase he uses here? It's a great, as a cloak for vice. Because we live in a fallen world, we will see abused and misused authority. People doing evil and causing their people to do evil. And we have lived in a, in a Christian country for a long time. For hundreds of years, Christianity has been the norm in the UK. The leaders in the governments may not have been Christians, uh, but they adhere to values that are found in our scriptures. Now we are entering perhaps the most dramatic upheaval that we've ever seen. That's not to say that there were golden days in, in days gone by. When we were looking at, on, on Wednesday, we were looking at um, the, the forward movement. And there were so many problems, uh, despite the, the, the amount of church attendance that was going on. Um, but in days gone by, Christian views on, on marriage and money and children and, and a whole host of other issues, uh, they were treated as the norm. Today, what we see voted through in our, in our parliament, what we see in the media is at large very different to what we teach in the Bible. Therefore, it will most likely come a time in the near future, if not in the, in the generation afterwards, whether we have to choose whether we submit to the government or to God, or whether we submit to God um, or the government through God. That's not something that we do lightly. If we refuse to submit to the government, we must not do it lightly, which leads to the last point. We look to Christ. Fifthly, look to Christ. We need to look at him. We need to look at the word of God. Like I said, there will come a time in the coming years where Christians will come under extreme pressure. You may feel that pressure already, but it's probably going to get a whole lot worse. How do we decide when we disobey? What I cannot do this morning is give you a long list of scenarios and tell you exactly what to do. There is a complexity to life that doesn't allow me to dictate 
what you should and shouldn't do in, in specific situations. I could offer my advice, but you could well disagree. And there are some things that I could tell you uh, that are cut and dried, of course, but other cases would need careful studying of God's words to see what it says. It would require patience and prayer and nuance in order to decide what the best thing to do would be. But the thing I want to hone in on is, is looking at Christ, to listen to God's words. Read God's words. In it, you will see what God is like. In particular, through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. See what Jesus values, what he holds dear, what he says about money. How does he value life? What does he say about marriage? How does he treat children? How does he respond to refugees and to social outcasts? In Christ, we see the very heart of God. We see what are matters of first importance to him and what isn't. And the more in tune we are to what the Bible says on different things, the more confidently we can approach times of scrutiny and difficulty knowing that we are obeying God. True justice, true goodness, true order is seen in Christ. And Peter gives us the tweet form of what he said earlier in verse 17. Honour all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the king. summarizes it all for us so that if you don't remember anything else you can remember that verse and like I said remember he was writing at a time where the leader was very much opposed to Christians he says honor him which our first hearing would have sounded crazy honor him but he says honor all people as believers we're supposed to honor Every person who God has created, whether they're prime minister or they're collecting our bins or or they're working at a desk beside us, whoever they are, we're to honor them. We honor them remembering that they have been made in the image of God. The Roman emperor at the time, as I've said before, saw himself as God. But Peter realigns their perspectives. And he says, we are only to fear God. Honor the emperor. But fear God. God is far above any leader. He is the only one with true power, true authority. Even the most feared, most powerful president or world leader, king or queen, is in God's hands, isn't he? Or she. We are also called to love the brotherhood. Far better name and cooler name than Christians, isn't it? The brotherhood. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as the world becomes more hostile towards Christians, we will certainly have to face difficult decisions. We will need our church family, won't we? When we are maligned for our faith, we need to be able to count on the prayers of those with us. We need to have the knowledge that we are supported by brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have deep love for one another. So we can share our concerns, we can go for walks, we can share meals, we can go for coffees, we can pray for each other, we can encourage one another. As Jesus told his disciples, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So it's, it's like a pyramid. Fear God at the top. It's not a perfect pyramid. Uh, the most important thing is, is fearing God. Then love the brotherhood, love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Honour all people, and that includes the emperor. I'm sure that would have annoyed an emperor if he read that. He's on the same level as everyone else, but we honour both of them. Christians have obligations to the state, to the government, but also to, to the rest of mankind. But their priority is God and to their brothers and sisters in Christ. My prayer for myself and for you this week is that you live that out. You don't just hear these things. I don't just read these things, but that we live them out. Amen. Let's pray.